<laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks for being here. Uh, I'll not make it too technical, so don't worry. Um, the talk is about computational stylometry, which is a rather new um, subject for machine learning approaches in natural language uh, processing, although it has a, a very old tradition. So what do I would like to do first is to um, frame the subject into the, the subject that you probably know a lot better uh, in uh, natural language processing and computational linguistics. You could say that there are three different levels of um, knowledge extraction from text that people are working on right now. One is, uh, goes under the heading of machine reading these days. It's a deep understanding of text as far as it's uh, factual. Um, so we want to find events, uh, concepts, attributes and relations between concepts. Uh, we want to be able to reason about space and time and causality. We want to take into account discourse uh, aspects and we want to link to world knowledge uh, in the form of ontologies or, or databases like Wikipedia that are semi-structured or structured. So that's the, let's say the core computational linguistics work these days. And just to give you an example, this is a description of the, the visit. Um, some of us went on uh, yesterday uh, of the castle. And there you see in blue the concepts, uh, references to the concepts in green, the relations. Um, no, in green is the time, um, time indicators. Red are the relations, etc. So you see this is a factual piece of text which contains a lot of factual objective knowledge. And you can link all the concepts to the Wiki Wikipedia, for example, or to, to ontologies. So that's the, the first level. The second level is a subjective knowledge extraction from text, which means that we are interested in, in finding opinions, sentiments, emotions, opinion holders, uh, things that someone has an op opinion about, etc. Um, and we try to also to reason about modality and uh, uncertainty. Now, as you will see in this text, there's not a lot of subjectivity. There are a few uh, indications of an opinion, but there's no modality at all, which is also normal for a factual text like a, descri a, a description. But what this talk will be about is a third level, which is perhaps less known, uh, which is uh, knowledge extraction at the meta level. So what can we learn not about the contents of the text, uh, the subjecti subjective and objective information, but what can we learn about the author of the text, about uh, the period when the text was written. So what can we learn about some attributes of the author, like uh, age and gender, personality, mental illness, social background, etc. So what can we find out about the author of the text from analyzing the linguistic uh, uh, properties of the text? So that's what this talk will be about. And uh, the way you would do that, for example, with this text is to study the function words because they don't have any content, uh, topical content. So you would look at uh, s uh, grammatical and spelling errors. And then you would come up with analysis of this type, which I don't know if it's true at all, that this text is written by a, an adult male, uh, non-native uh, speaker of, of English. So that's the type of meta-analysis that, that uh, you would try to do. Um, why is this, has this become suddenly so, uh, such a hot topic in computational linguistics, if you look at, at, at uh, publications, numbers of publications? Because this is, of course, very interesting if you can do it on, on the Internet and if you can analyze blocks, for example, and, and uh, chat uh, language, and if you can, can uh, that way uh, extract meta-information uh, for the semantic web automatically rather than um, having people put in this information by themselves. One person, researcher in social psychology who has made uh, the subject uh, um, very topical is uh, uh, Jamie Pennebaker of the University of Texas. Um, he's a bit controversial. Um, I will show you in a minute why. Um, th the first work he did was on, on therapeutic, therapeutic effects of writing so that you can uh, get healed by, by writing, etc. So now he moved to, to the an analysis, meta-analysis of text on the basis of pronouns, but he has a very nice book summarizing a lot of work, which is called The Secret Life of Pronouns, which appeared last year, and uh, where he has all kinds of interesting case studies, like the fact that 
we use more pronouns when we are depressed and that after 9-11, the Americans started using we rather than I in a statistically significant way in, in the, the blocks they, they wrote, for example. This is a recent uh, profile of the, the state, the mental state of Mitt Romney. Um, so you can go to this website, which is called analyzewords.com. Um, and if you have uh, someone you know who, has, uh, who tweets a lot in English, then you can analyze, let's say, the 50 last tweets of, of, uh, of this person and, and make a, a mental profile uh, and, and uh, uh, yeah, a relational profile. So we see here that, that um, th at the end of August, um, Mitt Romney was very upbeat and he comes across as rather arrogant and distant. Now, you probably have the same reaction as I have, that this, this is really a lot like uh, horoscopes and, and uh, astrology, because you can always find something that is true, and uh, there's not really a gold standard that you can uh, compare against. So I wouldn't take this as, as uh, definite proof that, that, that there's something into uh, this type of meta-analysis. But there are other studies which are scientifically very... Uh, well uh, supported, uh, like um, this landmark publication by uh, Argamon Koppel and um, a few other people, a series of, of articles starting from 2002, where they showed that it's possible to um, find out whether a text, even a non-fictional text, like a newspaper text or a scientific text, if this text was written by a man or a woman, by analyzing mainly the, feature wor the function words and, and uh, the parts of speech of, of the function words. So they also started with, with uh, framing this whole problem as a text categorization problem. Uh, you have feature vectors as input, which represent a document, and you have a class as output. And of course, that's supervised machine learning, uh, a supervised machine learning approach uh, that you can very easily apply to, to, uh, uh, to this type of, of new type of problem. And, and to much to their own surprise, because we know that you can hear from speech whether a woman or a man is speaking in most of the cases, but you can't get that from text, everybody thought, but it seems to be the case that you can, uh, with 80% accuracy, you can predict uh, gender differences. So I'm not going into that uh, in, in any detail, just to, to uh, point you out, because this is one of the, the publications that triggered us to, to start working on, on, on the, um, in this field. So you see, for example, that there are male function words and female function words. Um, men use a more um, descriptive, objective language. Uh, women use a more relational language, so they would use more relational pronouns like we and I and you etc., whereas men would use more determiners and quantifiers, so things objectively uh, describing um, um, objects and events. But what's striking is that this is even true in, 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 in regardless whether you are writing fiction or non-fiction. So a man writing fiction would also use this more objective style. Uh, a woman writing fiction, writing non-fiction, so a scientific text, would also use this relational style uh, significantly more than, than uh, male authors. And if you look at, at um, so this is Pennebaker's system, lexicon system, where he assigns different words to different emotional classes on which the Twitter application is based. It's called the Luke uh, categories. Um, then you see that if you analyze blogs that men talk more about jobs, money, sports, TV, women talk more about sex, family, eating, friends, sleep and emotions, either positive or negative. And of course, this is also very much horoscope uh, like. But the, 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 the difference here is that it's, it's uh, um, scientifically proven in a, in a well controlled uh, experiment. So you can by using a gold standard but that you know who the authors are and by, by doing text categorization and statistical, statistical significance analysis, you can say something more than just something vague about the mental state of a person. Now, the, I really would advise you to look at that publication because it, it's really very interesting. Um, and it's, it's the second trigger for our own research, which is um, a database of um, diaries by nuns in the U.S., which they took from uh, their 20s to their 80s or even 90s 
or until they died, as the case might be. Some of them died of, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Some of them stayed healthy until their 80s and, and, and 90s even. So there's, that's a, a fantastic database for doing text analysis because these nuns were obliged to write their biography again and again, so in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s. So they would write about the same topic um, at different ages, and you could see how language evolves uh, over, over time in the same person. What they measured was grammatical complexity and ID density, and ID density is, is really the, the, the number of predicates that you have per um, a set of words, and grammatical complexity, the, the number of... of uh, uh, sub sentences and, and, and conjoint sentences, etc. These persons are medical persons, not linguists, so they had a rather well superficial idea about measuring that. But on the other hand, they went much further than many of us are doing now in computational linguistics. So we saw yesterday uh, how, uh, how rare publications in authorship attribution in our field are using syntactic information, and these guys already did that. But what's really striking is the result. So for the nuns that didn't get um, Alzheimer's disease, they initially had higher scores than those nuns that did develop a, a form of dementia. <coughs> but the, the interesting part is that for the, the, the nuns who stayed healthy, the decline was much faster than for the, the nuns who got Alzheimer's disease. So the, the point is not really that you're, you're declining very quickly, which is uh, a problematic, but the fact that you start too low. So these um, researchers <coughs> came to the conclusion that it might be possible uh, in your 20s to already uh, predict whether uh, you are a, a pot potential victim for, for Alzheimer's disease, because if you don't start high enough, high enough then whatever decline you will get will, will get you be, be beneath some baseline that uh, would, would be unhealthy. <coughs> Th there's lots of uh, counter uh, arguments and, and there's a lot of discussion about that, but it shows you that there's a lot of information hidden in, in text that uh, you could try to explore um, and, and uh, try to study <coughs> scientifically. So what I would like to do is um, uh, talk a little bit about this, this idea of a human stylome uh, metaphorically related to the genome, so that's, let's say, the, the set of linguistic properties that you have in your style that uniquely define you, and um, what we can do with that in applications, and what current problems are that we see appearing in the, in the literature. So one problem is the problem of scalability, so it's, it's all right for two or three authors, but as soon as you take uh, hundreds or thousands of potential authors, the system breaks down. Uh, the same for the length of the document. It's okay if you have the collected works of Shakespeare, but if you only have a tweet of, of, of a few lines, it's much more difficult to do authorship attribution. What we want to do is not attribution, but verification. We want to know, was this text written by this person or not? And not uh, here is three potential writers. One of the three has certainly written uh, the, 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 the text, so point out which one is the case. So in machine learning terms, this is a completely different type of problem. Uh, there's the problem of cross share which has not been touched upon even, except in, in a little bit of work that I will describe. Um, so what if you have a, a suicide letter and you want to ascertain that this suicide letter was li really written by the, by the, the corpse, well, we he was alive, and uh, not by someone else? <laughs> so that's... That's a difficult problem because you only write a suicide letter once, right, normally. It's a very specific style of writing, and uh, if you only have blogs or scientific articles or, or things like that, then it's very difficult to extrapolate from that, from a classifier trained on that type of text to a completely different text jar. So the cross jar problem is, is really one that should be solved. And uh, the last problem that we try to tackle is uh, social network language, chat language, which is, has completely different properties than uh, normal uh, language uh, that scientists or, or, or poets or, no, not poets, that, that uh, novelists uh, use. So you get a, a whole different kind of, of problems there. 
And I will uh, sh uh, just point out a few studies that we did recently trying to get more insight into these problems. So this actually, uh, it's a good subject to work in. Uh, we have been able to attract a lot of funding in, in, uh, in this area because it's, it's uh, new and, 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 and people see that, that it has uh, potential applications. So there's quite a few people in, in our group working uh, on that right now and I would like to acknowledge them uh, also. Uh, I will tell you later uh, who is working on which topics. Okay, so the problem of the human stylome. Yeah. A technological question. Uh, you, you usually, or as, as far as I know, sometimes uh, the term ideolic is used. Mm -hmm. Is it rela related in, in your view? So it's stylum and ideolic? If ideolic is, is, is the language of one person, then it's the same. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, the human stylum um, is, of course, phrased in that way because, because of the potential detection. Uh, aspect the procedures to 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 analyze the the stylo um, well it's just just a, 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 a good way of, of getting funding it, it's it's probably better to use stylome than than to use uh, idiolect if you That's write a proposal it. yeah <laughs> so but okay but as linguists we, we know there's a lot of variation in language and and the variation comes from a lot of different um, uh, sources there's the text factors like char and register. There's the topic that, of course, of course, also determines the variation in the text, the time when the, the text was written, and then there's all the psychological and sociological factors that are, are actually the, the subject of social psychology or social language psychology and, and uh, social linguistics um, uh, to study that. So it's not these are not new areas. The problem from a machine learning point of view is that all these sources of, of variation uh, occur at the same time and that you have to untangle them. So that, that's, for example, the, the cross jar problem uh, comes from the fact that the style of the author interacts with the jar in the, or the register. Um, uh, the problem of um, um, which type of features you use are because you have to distinguish between topic-related variation and, and stylistic variation, etc. So variation due to style uh, is then defined as a combination of specific invariant and unconscious decisions in language generation at all linguistic levels associated with specific authors or author attributes like being male or being female, being uh, schizophrenic, uh, being uh, introverted, etc. So that's what, what the, the definition of style is. It should be invariant because otherwise we are in trouble if you t train a classifier it would not be um, uh, able to classify uh, still a few years later if it's not um, uh, invariant, for example. It should be in conscience, otherwise it's possible to, to fake uh, the style of other authors. That's also a sub-area that is only just starting. So uh, it's called adversarial stylometry. So can you find classifiers which are robust for uh, people trying to imitate the style of, of uh, others? And then the, the human stylome hypothesis, which was first, I think, um, um, written by uh, Hans van Halteren and co-authors, also Harold Bayen, I think, in the Journal of Quantitative Linguistics um, uh, paper, uh, where they, I have to admit, reinvented the concept of an idiolect, and uh, they say, um, well, if style is unique, then we can develop procedures to, to get at the identity of the, of the text um, with high certainty. So the method of choice, and this is uh, uh, since people like uh, Stamatatos uh, in Samos and, and uh, Koppel and Argamon in that group have started working in the area, the, the, the method of choice has, has converged to text categorization. Um, so we assume a function from document representations to classes and uh, actually, that's exactly the same definition as supervised machine learning. So all the, the technology that we have developed for text categorization, topical text categorization, genre categorization, etc., can, without any changes, be used for uh, these stylometric problems. So there is not really a problem. The big problem is in the document representations. So uh, which features will be the best to, um, to solve these different tasks? Will we 
make do with only bags of words, uh, bags of function words? Uh, will we need uh, other stuff, uh, more deeper analysis, uh, semantic information, pragmatic information, etc.? Because all that can potentially belong to the to the stylo. And then the machine learning methodology and, and systems will be the same, basically the same as for other text categorization problems. This is not for reading really, it's just a, a list of all the, the different um, uh, features that I've been able to find that have been used until now in stylometric research. They are at the word level, at the syntax level, at the semantic level, even at the pragmatic level also. Um, so lexical functional grammar uh, is used, uh, no, rhet rhetorical structure theory is used uh, even in, in authorship attribution studies. Uh, there are some features working at the document level, some at the sentence level, some at the word level, and some even at the character level. Um, applications or authorship attribution, obviously, but also profiling. So that's this new stylometry I, I was talking about. And there's really, and this is probably explains the, the, that it's rather easy to get funding for this type of research these days, because there's lots of disciplines that can profit from it uh, in literary science, uh, social, social linguistics, uh, language psychology, uh, all the social media um, uh, work that is going on is, 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 is actually relevant. This, this type of, of work is relevant. And even as I showed you, medical diagnosis potentially. Um, okay. Well, if, if there are any questions, please interrupt me. Um, I think I have not. There's, there's sufficient time for, for, uh, for questions uh, during the talk. If not, so yeah? Uh, how is it maybe related to you so far didn't mention, uh, say, uh, visual names like, say, Herdan or, say, Mandelbro, mm -hmm. uh, because they are, as far as I know, they were also interested in authorship. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, so the, they, they are actually, the, the whole uh, quantitative linguistics um, research discipline is potentially relevant for this work. What you see is, is that, that uh, people don't read that type of work mm -hmm. um, because now the, the machine learning, the text categorization is the framework. The yeah. So the, the paradigm is now the supervised machine learning approach rather than the, the, the more clustering uh, approach or the, or the text analysis approach, uh, which is not predictive. I think that's the big difference. You can, in a descriptive way, it's, it's like between descriptive and, and inferential statistics. So the, the old statistical uh, work, uh, linguistic, statistical linguistic work is, is, is mainly uh, descriptive, although they also uh, try to find laws, but these were very general, whereas the inferential approach or the machine learning approach is much more predictive. But I will come back to that, that this is probably one of the problems uh, also uh, in, in, in current work. Thank you. So um, one of the problems, and I will only go very briefly into that, is that uh, people have been over-optimistic about the possibilities of, of uh, machine learning approaches to authorship attribution as soon as the scale differs. So if you go uh, from... Uh, three or four authors to hundreds of authors, if you go from, from very large text to very small text, what you will see is, is, a, is a, a tremendous degradation of, of, the, of the accuracy of, of your, your classification-based approach. So the only uh, ray of hope there is that the features that you uh, use um, are actually robust uh, for different uh, numbers of, of authors or, or different sizes of text. So um, a feature representation, a document representation that will work well in the case of uh, only a few authors will also work well with many authors. And a feature representation that works well with long text will also work well with short texts, at least relatively speaking uh, to the other possible document representations or, or feature sets that you use. But otherwise, it, it's really depressing because you see the curve there. So this is only 145 authors. And on blocks, for example, you would like to be able to distinguish between uh, thousands of authors sometimes. So I'll just skip through it. This is the, the influence of the length of the document. And there you see a, a very linear relation. The more data you have, the, the better your uh, results will be. So if you are working at the, at the tweet level, you are in trouble. 
So, but again, uh, so the features, experiments you do, so that the, the sets of features that work well in one case will also work well in another case. And actually what we found is that uh, for normal odd chip attribution, character n-grams do a, a surprisingly good job at, uh, as, as document representations. And they are so simple, so you can write a two-line Python uh, script to uh, generate your, your document uh, uh, representations. You put it into a, a machine learner, you optimize the parameters, and you get a text categorization system, and it will probably outperform many of the more linguistically based uh, uh, sophisticated system. So there's, there is, has been some work on, on trying to find out why character n-grams. Um, uh, for those who don't know, it's just a string of, of two, three, or four uh, uh, continuous subsequential characters in, 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 the, in the text. You don't even have to care about tokenization and punctuation, etc. So that's only a marginal effect. Um, so why would that be a, a, a good representation? Well, it, it's, it's a statistical explanation, I think. Uh, they, uh, the frequent uh, character engrams are much more frequent than the frequent tokens, the frequent words uh, that you could use as a document. So they are, you can estimate them better in a statistical way than the, the, the more sparse uh, um, distributions of, of, of token, uh, token unigrams or bigrams or trigrams. And they contain a lot of information. For example, implicit punctuation, you just keep it there. Um, uh, you don't have to, to, to make errors in tokenization. Uh, you don't care about morphology because you will split up the word, so the suffixes and the prefixes will come out anyway. Also, the roots will come out, so the semantics will be there as well. And um, you will have a lexicon anyway because all the short function words in most languages will be there in, in the top uh, character uh, engrams. So the, the N might be different for your language. If you, are, if you have a morphologically complex language, N might have to be four or five. If you have English, it might, you might do with unigrams. No, no, not. You might do with uh, bigrams or trigrams. And for Dutch, for example, trigrams and, and, and foregrams uh, do uh, an excellent job. And they are also tolerant to errors. Um, so if you have spelling variants, um, a representation in terms of, of character engrams doesn't care about that because there will be enough similarity between the two strings anyway, to map them together as, as one unit. So they are much more, less sparse, and they are therefore they, they, they lead to much better uh, um, models, statistical models. Okay, second problem. So that's the problem of scalability. Um, um, I will come back to that when talking about um, uh, the, the, the methods in, in, in this experiment. Another big problem was the cross char authorship verification. So cross char means that you, um, you have uh, trained your classifier on one jar and now you want to test it on a different jar. Blocks, suicide letter, or theater, prose, that type of uh, jar difference. Um, so here's a, a number of contemporary uh, uh, English authors, or American and English authors, and um, the idea is to look how far we can get with, on the one hand, authorship verification rather than attribution, and on the other hand, how far we can get with cross char studies. So attribution is easy. Uh, given a text of an author, of potential authors, and an unknown text, and you know beforehand that the, the text was written by one of these authors, decide which one has written it. So a metaphor you could think of is, is if you have to classify a fruit and uh, as training examples you get apples and you get uh, bananas and then you say, okay, that's easy. If I use color as a representation, I will be able to 100% to discriminate between uh, the bananas and the, the apples. But as soon as you bring in the, the lemons and, and other fruit, it will become much more difficult. So that's where the degradation comes from. The features that you find as being uh, excellent for distinguishing between this set of three or four authors will not work if you take another set of three or four authors. There will be even no overlap. We did that type of experiments. There will be no overlap in, in, the, f in the, uh, the predictive features. So that's the problem of, of uh, uh, that's an explanation why attribution can get you up into the 95, 97%. It's also an explanation why we have to do verification rather than 
attribution because in verification we don't know if the text was written by the author or not. We might use some, some other people as imposters, as Koppel calls them, so as people that, that are uh, uh, similar to the author but, but, uh, but, but different to, to see if we can find a model. But the, mo the, the model should, di should say this text was written by this author or not. So that's a much more difficult task to, to do in a machine learning context. So for those in machine learning, they will recognize this uh, uh, immediately as a one-class learning problem. So uh, a problem where you only have positive examples and you can't really have a very good representative set of negative data. And learning without negative data is very difficult. So it's, it's a problematic. So the problem is, in that case, how do we find the representative sample of the negative class? Not the way people have been doing it in stylometry, because there you just have a set of authors, but uh, the set of negative authors is too small or not representative enough of all the possible negative uh, cases. So authorship verification, and I probably will not uh, go into too much detail, but it's, uh, it's actually a, a paper that has not had a lot of follow-up yet, even if it's, it's rather uh, old. Um, so again, this group, in, in Israel, uh, with Koppel and Schler, they uh, devised a system for authorship verification. And the, just to, to bring you into the philosophy, they started with a very naive method, saying, OK, I have um, a text by the author I'm interested in, and I have a, a, a new text. I'm going to divide that up into paragraphs, for example. I'm going to train a classifier to distinguish between these two. If I am successful in distinguishing, it's probably not the same author. If I'm not successful in, in, in classifying them in cross-validation, then probably uh, um, uh, it's the same author, right? And the reasoning is simple. If you have uh, the text, the training text and the anonymous text written by the same author, it will be very hard for a machine learning algorithm to distinguish between them. So that way you could be uh, able to say it was written by the same author or it was written by different authors. A lot of success, it, it will be uh, different authors because that's the, the apples and bananas situation. Okay? Unfortunately, it doesn't work. It, it's too easy. Uh, again, unfortunately, so because a small set of features can, can also lead you to, to, uh, to false, false negatives. So in, in that case, you say, uh, okay, they are clearly different, uh, but whereas in fact they, they have been written by the, by the same author. So it's not reliable, but, but keep in mind the philosophy, because the real algorithm is a lot more difficult uh, to explain also, and I don't know if I will do a good job at it, um, but it's, it's based on the same philosophy except that it's also iterative. So they call it unmasking. And in that case, you have a number of imposters, so that uh, writers that, that are related to, to the, the, the author that you're interested in. Um, and you have a text, an anonymous text. And the problem setup is verification. So has this anonymous text been written by this target author or not? Okay, so for each combination of two texts, again, we split up all the data into paragraphs or, or, or long paragraphs uh, or, or sets of paragraphs so that we have enough material to have different instances for the machine learning. For each combination of text, we are going to uh, um, generate a curve, and the curve is built by doing the, the naive experiment, but iteratively. So in each iteration, we will throw out the best features, the, best, the most discriminative features, do the experiment again, train again, test again, and then see how much um, decrease we have in accuracy for, for that case. So we do that for all pairs of, of, of texts that we can find between uh, the imposters and, and the author uh, and the author text. So we'll get a bunch of, 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 uh, of graphs, and now we need a meta-learner to take these graphs as input and to learn which one of these graphs will be um, b written by the same author or representing a situation where the same author was, has written both texts and those cases where it was uh, a, a different author. So same and different. So you have a binary classifier again, working not on the text, but on the graphs that your previous uh, experiment has, has produced. 
So that's uh, it takes it takes a while before uh, it, it becomes clear. But you it, it, it's actually um, written very well in in their their paper. So you need a meta learner to to decide which changing curve is actually indicative of same author and, and, and different author. But visually, there's no problem at all. I, sh I will show you an example of their, their own study. So you see here an ideal husband as the target text, and then um, a number of different authors that could have, have written it. And the declining curve is Oscar Wilde, who has indeed written uh, this book. And all the others are the, the imposters. So they stay at the same level. Why is that the case? Um, if you are the same author, there will be difference, differences between all the texts you have written, but these will be the most discriminative um, uh, features. So if you iteratively throw out these features, you will very quickly deteriorate because the very few um, features that distinguish your work X from your work Y will disappear very quickly. If you have texts written by two different authors, there will be very many stylistic differences. So uh, however hard you try in, 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 in mutilating the model by throwing out uh, uh, predictive features, they will stay about at the same level. They will stay equally good or equally bad. Uh, there will not be a lot of change. So that's the, the reasoning behind it. And it works surprisingly well, except that you need a lot of text to make it work. So the study we did was to combine the two most difficult issues uh, currently, so the uh, verification instead of, of attribution and cross-genre instead of single-genre authorship attribution in um, a paper that appeared recently in, in uh, the journal English Studies um, in a special issue on authorship attribution, which is very interesting also for the other uh, articles which, which give background, um, let's say very topical background on, on, on that issue. So we did a cross genre authorship attribution experiment and um, in, in an authorship, in this unmasking uh, setup that was uh, invented by Koppel and others. Why did we think that we would be successful? Because um, it would make sense that the most discriminative features, so the ones to throw out first, would be those features that distinguish between different genres. For example, stage directions in, in, in theater or uh, I don't know what could, could, could be, be the case. So that there could be very different properties of um, prose and theater that the unmasking method would get rid of very quickly and, and there, thereby uh, get, get us at the really deep differences or similarities between texts. So the data we used were five contemporary authors uh, who had the criterion for selection was really that they had bo written both theater and, and prose because we wanted to do a, a cross char setup and relatively large texts. I'll jump to the conclusions immediately or to the results. As features, we just use the most frequent words here. This is really an initial study. We should also try with other features. For prose, the so single genre approach works like a dream. For prose, we, we got very high F scores. For the theater, we got worse, but still statistically significant. The explanation here is that the theater texts are, compared to the prose text, very short. And the method of unmasking seems to work only with, with rather long, long uh, texts. But then, of course, the, the proof of the pudding was in whether it would work also for the cross genre. And there, uh, so this is still the, the single genre setup. But uh, there we had a problem because the F-score actually dropped, still sig statistically significant, but, but uh, dropped very close to the, to the baseline. So it didn't work for the cross-genre uh, setup, unfortunately. Uh, we have not yet given up. Um, uh, Mike Kestemont, who is mainly doing the work on this, uh, is trying with, with other parameter settings and, and optimization methods, other features, other machine learning methods, etc. But uh, we will not we will get better, but we will not get really uh, a lot better. So it doesn't seem to work for the cross um method, but then nothing works for the cross setup until now. So that's still an, an open problem to work on. 
What is um, encouraging is that, that our hypothesis was true, but not probably not true enough to, to m get better results. So indeed, you get names of principal characters as the most predictive features that you throw out very quickly. You get stage directions and colloquialisms in theater text. You get description, uh, descriptive and introspective words in prose. Of course, this is a very qualitative analysis. We didn't do that in a really quantitative way. But it seems to work, sort of, but not well enough for the cross-genre problem. Okay, then the, the last uh, case study I want to describe is the Daphne project, which is uh, a PhD project uh, by uh, um, Claudia Peersman in, in our lab. Uh, so the task she has is to work with, with uh, a social network called uh, Netlog, um, actually, it's a kind of a Facebook, but uh, rather local, although they have something like 50 different languages. But it, it's, it's targeted towards young people wanting to meet, it, meet each other. So it, it, it always has had a little bit of, of a dating aspect also, for, but then for young, young people. Uh, that makes it very open and there's there therefore very vulnerable for, for, uh, for criminals, um, like pedophiles. So the goal was to de devise a text categorization silometric system that could analyze, let's say, or find out, identify pedophiles active in, in, the, in the, this network. There are other ways of doing that. You can look at IP addresses and how many times a, a person changes profile, etc. So these are also taken into account, but here we wanted to look only at the text aspects of, uh, um, of pedophile language use and in, in, in social media. Um, so we have two classifiers there. One compares the profile that the person has given to the profile as it turns out to be from text analysis. For example, you could find a mismatch between a profile that says I'm a 12-year-old girl and actually if you analyze the text it would be a 50-year-old male. Then that would be easy to pick out then. That would, uh, let's say, ring an alarm bell and then you, you could analyze automatically also the interactions and see if something Fishy is going on, like grooming. So that's how, how police enforcement uh, organizations use this, this behavior, where uh, people try to get other people uh, to do some uh, things, uh, like make, uh, make a, a meet in person or, or uh, uh, use a webcam or whatever. So that, that's the, the typical situation we are interested in. Of course, there's a moderator in between. Uh, they do that now also, but uh, they have millions of interactions uh, every hour. Uh, so how can they read everything and follow up everything? For, their, for example, for their visual material, they have uh, a large group in India doing nothing else than, than looking at profile photos and, and at, at, at uh, photos posted on, on that social network and, and then throwing them out if, if they... they uh, with some very interesting cultural uh, differences, but I will not go into that, about what is allowable or not in different uh, cultures. Um, but we still need the moderator also for the, 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 the conversations and for the, the, the textual aspects. So what we were asked to do is to optimize on recall rather than precision, because then if, if we can narrow down these millions of, of interactions every hour to a few thousand where something might be going on. Even if there's a lot of innocent interactions there, they, they would be helped a lot because then they would only have to look at these few hundreds or thousands cases rather than at uh, the whole uh, database. I don't know how, how it is in, 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 uh, in, in, in Czech or, or in, in, in other more complex, uh, morphologically complex languages, but for Dutch, um, the, the, the chat language is really very special. Um, so one of our colleagues in Antwerp, uh, Renild van der Kerkhove, uh, even wrote or, or defined two maxims about that. So Dutch, at least Flemish uh, uh, children, younger people, uh, write as fast as they can to ensure fluent interaction and they write the way they speak to ensure the informal character of the conversation. So it's completely different from, from uh, edited text or, or, or written text in, in normal, e email si even in email situations. So they, they want to, to be, uh, be responsive, so they, they make a lot of mistakes, they, they, they use abbreviations, they use colloquialisms, they use dialect. So they simply write their dialect to be informal. So I would be interested if, that, if dialect, for example, is, is a property of chat language in, in other languages as well. In Dutch, it's a big problem. 
It's a big problem because we have to normalize that if we want to use the special purpose tools. And then you say, okay, you're saying that the character engrams are doing so well, so use the character engrams, but they don't work for chat language either. And that's, we don't have an explanation for that, but uh, we have a problem there. On the other hand, due to the fact that it's so um, um, idiolectic, um, it's also very easy to use, and it's we, we can get very high accuracy um, a prediction of, of gender and age and, and dialect even, so region, uh, based on very small uh, chat uh, text. So, uh, yeah, just look at the leftmost column. There you see the, the different type of, of processes that you see in chat language in Dutch, omission of letters, abbreviations, acronyms, character flooding, uh, concatenation of, of, uh, of words, and actually, we also have a person working on medieval uh, text categorization or, or authorship attribution, medieval Dutch. And you see exactly the same properties uh, before there was a standard language um, in, in the old texts, so in, in the texts of the, of the 12th to the, the 15th, uh, 16th century. You see exactly the same uh, things like concatenation, uh, omission of letters of words, uh, different spellings of the same word depending on the pronunciation, the local pronunciation. So you could say that medieval language is a bit like chat language in that respect. And you can use the same techniques to, to solve it. This is a very nice graph summarizing the sociolinguistic aspects of um, uh, Dutch, Flemish um, chat language users. So on the x-axis you see the age going from 15 to uh, 45, 50, and um, vertically you see the, the uh, proportion of non-grammatical or non-standard language that, that they use. And there you see that at around 20, uh, there's a steep decline. So that's when people leave school, they, they go for jobs, and, and uh, they, they are supposed to, to be serious, more serious. So they start using standard language. And before that, it's really chaos. So they, most of, of the words in, 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 the, in the chat is, is, is uh, non-standard. And you, so you can even see there, and this is really a goldmine for social linguists, that, uh, for example, in Western Flanders, uh, people use more dialect than in, in Limburg. And uh, you can see that, that uh, men use more um, uh, chat-type uh, language constructs than, than women do. And that's, that's all these effects are statistical, and they, they have also been shown by uh, anecdotal studies by social linguists. But here you can actually see them in a large corpus that you can completely analyze. So uh, based on that data we got from Netlog, we were able to, to make um, uh, classifiers that can predict age and gender and even location. So that's used for the mismatching. If we find a mismatch in profile from the text and as given by the, the author, um, we can uh, notify the moderator of that. And uh, yeah, something we still have to explain is why character engrams are underperforming. Now, we don't have data for grooming yet for, for Dutch, for analyzing, the, let's say, the second step in, in the, the architecture. But there is a competition, actually, not next week, but the week after that, there's a conference in Rome about this problem. So you now can even get data from the internet to, to, to train your own pedophile, pedophile detection system. We thought we were being original with the research, but everybody is, is, is doing it these days. So it's called the Sexual Predator Identification in Chat uh, competition. And the transcripts are taken from um, um, a website called Perverted Justice, where American volunteers try to trick uh, pedophiles into uh, um, a conversation. So they would act as if they are children and then try to attract pedophiles. Uh, I don't want to discuss, I'll think even about <laughs> the moral and ethical uh, issues about that, but it's interesting data, but, but it's, it's controversial data and probably not, not really reliable because it's artificial. Um, and the task here in this competition were to identify the pedophiles and the most distinctive utterances. I, I will not go into, I, I want to leave a, a bit room for, for discussion, so I will not go into the um, results. Depending on how you define the, the, the evaluation, so if you use F-scores or, or uh, F-scores 
biased towards recall or precision. Everybody is a winner, but um, uh, we did reasonably well with this with this uh, data because English is not our prime language we use. Okay, so this just summing up this case study, um, even for fairly difficult cases like detecting pedophiles in, in social networks that have an enormous societal relevance, it is possible to use the state-of-the-art techniques uh, as, 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 as it is now, which is uh, encouraging. And there's much more work there to do. So we started a, a project now on cyberbullying, so detecting cyberbullying um, in, in a cross-modal setup so that you also use pictures in uh, detecting depression and self-mutilation uh, pictures and, and warning, uh, um, say, uh, moderators about that. So the whole moderation automation issue is, is becoming very important because it's, it's, it can't be done by hand. And uh, legally, uh, these, these networks are required to, 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 to uh, safeguard um, their, their, or at least to, to moderate their, their, uh, their networks. Okay, I would like to stop with a, um, a bit of a wild idea that we have started uh, working on. Now, this, this, this association of the human stylome uh, brings up techniques also that have been used for the, the genome, to analyze the genome. So one type of study that is used a lot is a genome-wide association study. So this is called a, a Manhattan uh, graph, um, and where you see for the different chromosomes uh, and the different genes, you see the, the different possible alleles that they can have. So the, so in terms of features, it's the different features and the different possible feature values and how feature values are related to, for example, a disease uh, or to some trait uh, in two different uh, subpopulations. So they would take people with Alzheimer and people without Alzheimer, uh, get a lot of uh, uh, genetic data about persons in both groups and then do statistical studies comparing um, uh, these different graphs. They are interesting because they show you, uh, so this might be the character engrams, for example, and you see there's, there's a high, cor uh, high correlation with the output class, uh, disease or not. But there might be other regions also that have a strong, cor uh, a strong correlation, and there might be correlations also at the horizontal axis so that certain sets of features are, are inter-replaceable, etc., so that type of study you could also do for, for, uh, for the stylome. You could, could uh, have horizontally, instead of chromosomes, all the different uh, types of, of linguistic features that have been proposed, and then have a reference corpus that should be very balanced and, and should be contain as many uh, men as, as, as women, etc. So it will be very costly and hard to build it up. But you can start with, with, with more small-scale studies a bit in... in in the, in the uh, philosophy of, of what uh, Adam Kilgariff was talking about a few days ago, that you have two subcorpora that you statistically um, uh, compare and that, you, and that, for example, differ in one dimension, male, female, um, um, schizophrenic, non-schizophrenic, and that you try to connect with interacting uh, features in, in, in this type of, of setup. So we have started uh, trying to... to, to uh, I think it's a really fundamental issue and uh, it should be funded as a fundamental research issue, but that's very hard to get uh, funding for. So if anyone is interested in pooling resources, um, let me know. Um, yeah, that's just what I said. The difficult problem here is the sample stratification. You need really need a, a very balanced corpus along all the different dimensions that I showed in the first one of the first slides, all these different sources of, of, of variation. So in conclusion, um, I think that mapping linguistic features to uh, author traits, so stylometry, uh, has met with some success. It seems to, to work, uh, but there's still a lot of problem, problems. One is that we want explanations rather than prediction, coming back to, to the, the more descriptive uh, work that, that is older. So what do we know if we know this, this, this bag of, of character engrams can predict whether uh, uh, someone is male or female? You would like a, a little bit more, uh, like the graph I showed you about uh, the social linguistic variation in, the, in, the, in chat language for, for Flemish Dutch. That's the type of information that we would like more because that gives you really an explanation also. Uh, there are explanations why Western Flanders 
um, is, is more linked to their local dialect than, than, than the people from Limburg, etc. But you need sociologists and social linguists to, to provide these explanations. And, and therefore, we should give them tools and, and should give them results that they can do something with. And that's not a bag of, of character engrams. Um, secondly, we have to solve a number of very difficult problems, the scalability problem, the verification problem. Um, we want scalable methods. I already mentioned that. Um, and this is really, I think, um, something that you can only solve with these, with these uh, um, style on white studies. You have to, 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 to try to find uh, what individual style um, makes a person different from the fact that he uses a specific char or a specific topic, etc. So all these interactions should be modeled. And we need large-scale systematic studies. So even the benchmark studies of, of for example, Juola's uh, benchmark study was, was mentioned. That's good, but it, it, it's too too little, and, and uh, there should be much more balanced uh, corpora to, to do this, this type of studies. Okay, that's it. I'll just list you the people who have uh, worked in the lab on different aspects of the, of the research, and uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Yeah, so we're looking for an explanation for that, and it has to be the Dutch chat language, which somehow yeah. is, is uh, yeah, we find that time is better yeah. than shorter ones, and also there is a uh, way how do you use them. So we build yeah. uh, thin tenons based on them, yeah. but we build them in the way it's done in the um, uh, network intrusion detection, which is you don't compute frequencies because this can dilute. Yeah. Interesting part in, in, the, in the large mass of irrelevant things, you just take presence or non presence, and based on that, you get tenants. Yeah. So, this works for us. Yeah, we have to try more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, I work with uh, de not detecting uh, style for the uh, uh, for poli police uh, purposes, but uh, in, uh, I, I work with uh, detecting patterns in translation. Uh, from from a source text to target text in uh, in Portuguese, and um, and I found I found uh, patterns that were more stable to the to the uh, to the author uh, on the key log than on the, uh, the target text. So uh, there are various patterns in the key log, uh, both in the because the the hand of the the writer is one key to the mm -hmm. to the right or to the left and. There are many patterns that you can find in the key log that would probably uh, be useful for the pedophile uh, detection mm -hmm. because you can get the key log uh, on, on the, from, the, uh, from the input uh, of the website. So right. the, yeah. that, that could uh, make the, the data more reliable because the, the t uh, one thing I thought while we were showing that curve of adults using more regular language um, it may be the case that a, that a person trying to imitate a child's, uh, child's or a teenage uh, way of speaking 
would write first, for instance, Baron, and then mm -hmm. uh, replace that for uh, a shorter version, and many, or maybe have a more uh, more practice with a keyboard than mm -hmm. a teenager would have. So that's a good suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, so Delamont has to run for his train. So, <laughs> so, so our time is out. So. Uh, thank you once more, and also I should remind you that uh, not only this, but also the previous uh, invited talks are already, uh, you can see them on the address video muni cz, CZ and uh, so you can view them uh, on, on, those, on this address, and also they will be later linked to the pages of the conference. And so thank you once more for nice and very interesting talk. Thank you.